Hi, this is Sarit Switzer, and welcome to the It Is Taught podcast, a podcast devoted to the teachings of Rabbi Schneer Zalman of Liadi, as recorded in his most famous work, the Tanya. My hope for this show is to make these teachings accessible and relatable to the average person, regardless of prior Jewish education or affiliation. The episodes follow the prescribed daily study portions and are meant to serve as practical lessons in how to live your life as your true self and develop an authentic and powerful relationship with your creator. I have personally experienced the effects the study of this work has had on me, and I'm excited to share what I can of this knowledge with you. So please join me on this journey of learning, self-growth, and connection with your source. Hi, and welcome to the It Is Top podcast. This is episode 636 for the third of Elul in a regular year. Uh, so today, we are going to continue our discussion of boundaries. So we began this discussion a couple of days ago, and we were talking about boundaries in the context of really understanding it uh, in, hum- in terms of human relationships, first of all, and in terms of codependence and how codependent relationships don't really have any boundaries. And that's kind of the defining factor with them all is that people kind of live under this false illusion that the way to get close to another person is to have no boundaries, to just like really be as open as possible, to be as enmeshed as possible with the other person. When in fact, what psychology has really shown and what life experience really shows is this is not the case at all. And actually what makes for a healthy relationship is to have healthy boundaries, is to have um, a a distinction between me and you, to have rules of, uh, of engagement, rules of even with spouses, date night, you know, um, having rituals of I, I bring you tea every morning. I uh, I greet you at the door when you come home from from work. Whatever it is, every every relationship, every situation has its own set of boundaries. And we talked about this in terms of God, and we talked about how our ultimate relationship in life is really with God. This is the relationship that supersedes all of our other relationships, and is kind of the umbrella from which all other relationships flow. And we said that it's interesting interesting to see <clears throat> that when it comes to our relationship with God, we see that God set it up with boundaries as well. He gave us specific rules to live by. And these rules have very specific measurements to them. So whether we're talking about putting on tefillin, lighting Shabbos candles, keeping Shabbos, uh, all of these things, there's all very specific measurements to them. And even those type of mitzvahs that seemingly seem a little bit boundless, like when it comes to loving God or fearing God, we actually learned that these two have a certain level of boundness to them because we can only love God to the extent of the limits of our heart. And this is actually for our sake, because if we were to have a limitless kind of love of God, we would actually expire. There would be no us, just like the Havdiel in a, again, a codependent relationship where the, you get lost in the other person because you lose your entire sense of self. So So we saw this actually at the time at Mount Sinai when we loved God so much, when it was like God's God's presence was so overpowering when he revealed himself on the mountain to everybody to all the Jews when he started giving, saying the 10 commandments and we, we literally expired our, our bodies physically expired. We couldn't handle it anymore. So then we came back to life and then God gave us this same thing, but in a, in a bound way, in a way that it's like not going to be too much revelation so we can love God, but in a way that's more contained. So containment actually is what can bring us closer, is what can bring us to develop actually a more enhanced uh, and profound relationship with the other person. And today we're going to actually take this discussion and and make it, and we're going to realize that it's actually a little bit more nuanced, this idea of boundaries, especially when it comes to giving charity, which as you've noticed is a very big theme of this section of the Tanya. So why is it more nuanced? Because while it's true that as we learned yesterday, the mitzvah of giving staka also has limitations, also has measurements, boundaries to it. Um, that there's this idea that you're really a, a person that's like an intermediate kind of person should give 10, like kind of like the bare minimum is you should give 10% of your money to staka. Somebody who's like a little bit over and above that, who wants to do a bit more, they can give up to a fifth of their money to staka. But you're really not supposed to give more than that. That's kind of like according to the letter of the law. 
Okay, but then this is where the, the discussion gets interesting. It's just like, let's think about a relationship again between, let's say, a husband and wife who have their certain boundaries, who have their rules of engagement. They have their specific rituals that they live by. So let's say, you know, one of the rules is that the woman greets the husband every day when he comes home from work right at the door. And this is what she does. Does she have a cake for him? No, not necessarily. You know, maybe if it's his birthday, sure. But like, it's not every day. You know, does she have like uh, balloons for him or something like that? Does he have flowers for her? I mean, maybe again on her birthday special occasion or something like that. But there's kind of like the, the, what they, the agreement that they came to is that they greet each other when he comes home from work with a nice smile, maybe a hug, maybe a kiss, you know, and that's, that's kind of it. And they maybe even came to some kind of agreement that they're not going to get each other presents because it can get kind of pricey. And that like, especially when sometimes you might have this with friends, for example, taking this in a little bit of a different direction, that let's say for friends' birthdays, you kind of have an agreement of a set price of how much you're going to spend on the other person because you don't want to put the other person out, first of all, and you don't want, you want to set the expectations. So it's like if one person can only afford $20, the other person shouldn't spend a hundred dollars on the other person because then when the it, it for their birthday because then when the situation flips and it's the person's birthday who gave a hundred dollars their their friends might not be able to afford that so you want to kind of set the bar at twenty dollars right okay but what happens so this is all nice and good when the relationship is even kill and we're in a good situation and everybody's happy and everybody's getting along but what happens if there's a breach if there's some kind of breach in the relationship what happens if the husband, God forbid, cheats on his wife? What happens if the wife, God forbid, speaks about her husband behind his back and says something really nasty, really not nice about him? God forbid. Or what happens in a relationship with friends if one of the friends does something to really hurt the other one, does something really not good to the other person? So, okay, so now let's say they want to remedy the relationship. They want to come back into the good graces with the friend. They want things to be as before. Would it then, do you think, be enough to just go back to how things were, to have the husband and wife just go back to greeting each other pleasantly at the door, maybe a nice hug, maybe a nice kiss, and that's about it? Or do you think that maybe the person who did the wrongdoing might want to, in this case, take the opportunity to make an exception to the rule, to an exception to these boundaries that they usually have and extend themselves a little bit more. Maybe if the wife did something to hurt her husband, maybe she will bake him a cake in this case, you know? Maybe she'll make him those special cookies that he really likes. Maybe she'll buy him a nice new suit or whatever it is. Same thing with the husband. If he did something that was really not okay, he's for sure going to want to do something to really overextend his boundaries beyond the norm. Same thing with friends. If one friend hurts another, maybe they'll, in addition to buying them that present for their birthday, they'll take the friend out to dinner. They'll do something extra nice without the expectation that the friend's going to do that in return because it's kind of an understood thing that I'm extending my boundaries to you because I hurt you because I did something that was not okay and I want to fix that. So that's what we're going to learn about today. That yes, sure, when it comes to the mitzvahs, when it comes to our relationship with God, God set up boundaries just like every relationship has. And these boundaries are for our sake, for his sake, in order for us to bond. But there are times, especially when it comes to the mitzvah of charity, that we actually are encouraged to extend our boundaries a little bit, to not be such a stickler for these boundaries, for these like, oh, this is as much as I can give of myself, I, I can't give any more. When does this happen? When we mess up, when we make mistakes, when we do things that are against the will of God, which pretty much who can say that they're not guilty of this time here and there, right? And so why is this? Because the power of tzedakah is so powerful to the point that like, it's like when we give tzedakah, what we're doing is we're drawing down God's light. And we spoke about this yesterday, that it's like the way that we draw down God's, God's light, again, is in this bound way, because it's like these boundaries this, this, uh, if we want to use the Kabbalistic terminology, it's the Gvora that is, is, is coming from the Chassid. The Gvora is what gives this, the, the vestment, the Lavush for the Chassid to come down. So it's specifically these boundaries that allow the flow and the influx of Hashem's Chassid to come down into this world. But again, 
if we want to, if, if we did something to obstruct this flow of energy in some way, because every time we do something that's God forbid against the will of God, this causes an obstruction of that energy flow, then we're going to need an extra power. We're going to need to do something a little bit extra in order to cause there to remove that blockage to cause there to be a more a, a greater influx of that missing energy and that's where that stucca comes in because stucca has that power specifically we spoke about this in numerous epistles already that there's something about stucca specifically that has that power to draw down god's light in this way that none of the other mitzvahs really can on the same level which is why it's called mitzvah it's called simply the commandment because it is so powerful it's called it's called a uh, masa it's called the deed because it is this action of drawing down God's goodness into the world. So, so again, this is why if, if we do mess up, which we usually time, which we chances are we probably will here and there because we are human, we shouldn't be such sticklers for this, like giving a 10th, giving a fifth or whatever. These are times when we actually can extend our boundaries, just like a spouse or a friend who messed up somehow in their relationship with the other is going to want to extend their boundaries. And the extent of how much they messed up is going to, to be, to be the gauge to in which to know how much they should extend their boundaries. So with that being said, let's get into the text today and uh, and see how the altar explains all of this. We are in the middle of Epistle 10 of Igeret Kodesh, And so here we go. So the altar begins and he says that, however, and now this is where the discussion becomes more nuanced, as I mentioned in the introduction. So the Alter Rabbi says that this limit that's imposed upon the mitzvah of tzedakah, this is specifically for somebody who keeps Torah and does not deviate from it to right or to the left, even for as much as a hair breath. So again, this is like, you know, again, with spouses or with friends, if you have a, an agreement about presents, about birthdays, about greeting each other, whatever it is, that agreement that you have, that um, the boundaries that you set up with that in terms of how you relate to one another only work are only relevant in so far as everybody keeping to those uh, to the agreement, keeping to the relationship, keeping to the covenant of the relationship, whatever that entails. But somebody now back to the text, somebody who God forbid transgresses from this way, from from the way of God, God forbid. Um, so since he distorted his course, so then there's a, a diminishment in the supernal holiness. Uh, so because then that means that his there, there's the it's like the the drawing down of this light became diminished in terms of its quality and it could have come down uh, like it's like it's compromised it's a it's a compromised influx of light that is compromised in relation to the amount of light and the quality of light that could have come down to somebody who is keeping Torah and mitzvahs and keeping it according to Allah and so thus this type of breach, this type of distortion can only be fixed by drawing down a light that's higher than all of the worlds and that's not vested within it, all of them. And this is what we call chesed ila'a, the rav chesed, the supernal chesed or the, or the great chesed. And if you recall yesterday, we actually spoke about this, how there's two types of chesed. So now we're going back to that idea. We mentioned this idea that there's the chesed olam, and then there's Rav Chesed. So there's the Chesed of the world, and then there's the supernal, the great Chesed. So now we can kind of understand that. There's the basic level of Chesed, which is Chesed Olam, the Chesed of the world. And then sometimes when, you know, when there's a breach in some way in our relationship with God, we actually require a much higher type of Chesed, which is this Chesed Ilah, this Rav Chesed. And so why do we need this higher type of Chesed? Because this type of Chesed that comes from a place that's above all the worlds, that comes from a place that is straight from infinity that's beyond measurement at all uh, because it's not constricted within the worlds, but rather it's just like uh, encompassing them from above, from the from the beginning of all the rungs until the end of all the rungs. And so when a person draws these down by by his deeds through the Esar Tata, through this arousal from below, then this supernal light comes down and um and becomes vested with all in all the worlds and this is this is what actually is able to rectify these distortions that happens and this uh this deficiency that that happens in this uh in in the holiness above so then what happens is that this light then becomes renewed 
and becomes better, like uh, the goodness of this light becomes renewed with an even greater strength because now we're bringing down an even greater light. So what's happening is that we're not only just like fixing the breach, but we're actually drawing down something greater. So it's like, again, we can think about this in terms of a relationship with spouses or a relationship with friends that if one of the spouses or one of the friends does something to, um, to breach the contract in some way. And then that person that breached the contract goes over and above and extends themselves, extends their boundaries really truly like in this very grandiose kind of way. If the other person really sees that this is coming from a very sincere place and coming from a real place of forgiveness, you know, then really, then that actually is, uh, it can, can strengthen the relationship. Obviously, every relationship's different. Obvi obviously, it depends on how bad the breach was. Some things are forgivable, some things aren't forgivable. But in this case, what we're talking about in terms of God is this is God's saying that God's light is so powerful that this that what's actually happening when we give that extra measure of stucca, it's drawing down from a light that is higher than all these boundaries. And thus it comes down and it, it brings this influx of inflow of light that is greater than there was before. And now we can understand this is how the altar of it concludes with a teaching that we find in Brachos, page 34b from the Gemara, where it says, B'makom tshuva umdim. So this basically means it says where Bali Tshuva stand, like those people who sinned and then repented and came back, then even the totally righteous, the, the complete Sadiqim cannot stand there. Meaning to say that they, these people that, that sinned and then came back, they have something about them. There's something more powerful about them than even totally righteous people. And we can understand this now through this teaching that we learned about this, uh, this light that gets drawn down after the breach has been made. So, uh, so obviously, again, we don't want to seek breaching the relationship with God or with anybody, really. You know, we want to keep to the boundaries of the relationship to the best of our ability. But inevitably, it might happen that we do breach the relationship in some way. And then the altar is giving us this like positive spin on that of that. In that case, what we can actually do is we can actually take the opportunity to draw down an even greater light through this, through giving extra stuck. So that's it for today. And we will continue with this epistle tomorrow. And I will speak to you then. Thanks for listening to the It Is Top podcast hosted by Sarit Switzer. This podcast is dedicated in loving memory of my maternal grandfather, Avraham Yitzchak ben Binyamin Cohen of Blessed Memory. Music by Shoshana. If you enjoyed this episode and would like to support the show, please share it with others and subscribe on YouTube, Apple iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And make sure to leave us a five-star review. To find out more about the It Is Top project, including more information on my soon-to-be-published book, please visit our website, itistaught.com. To catch the latest from me, follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Looking forward to speaking with you tomorrow, and until then, have a great day.